Then what is pattern analysis? In essence, it's applying a label to multiple differing given input values or stimuli to generalize, uh, to gener generate a most likely or probabilistic match of the individual inputs handled in a Bayesian way. So what you're doing is you find the most precise and highest order signal, symptom or sign that waits a diagnosis, and then you add in others that gradually make the probability more and more accurate. And non-medical examples include speech recognition systems, postal codes on envelopes, fingerprint analysis and so on. And those exemplars usually involve a sequencing approach. But it also can happen in situations where you're required to make a judgment just simultaneously or on a single um, uh, cue. And the example there is obviously chess players, particularly the professional chess players who just look at a board or 30 boards just walking, walking by in a fairly rapid way and can come up with the next move in two or three seconds, whereas the people um, who are not at that level of expertise might wait half an hour. And Kahneman um, refers to Herbert Simon, who actually did study chess masters, um, and showed that after thousands of hours, they actually see the chessboard differently from the rest of us. And Simon was opposed to an intuition model. It's not simply intuition. He says there's a cue there. The cue gives the expert access to information stored in the memory, and the information provides the answer. Intuition in this instance is nothing more than pattern recognition. And some intuition draws primarily on skill and expertise acquired by repeated experience. Yeah? That, yeah, that might be better. Thank you very much. Okay. So to continue with chess, um, Chess masters take at least 10,000 hours to acquire that level of skill. And that's really interesting because it fits in with the Malcolm Gladwell phenomenon that any skill takes 10,000 hours. Although um, when I started to learn bridge a couple of years ago, the bridge master I was with said he actually thought ch uh, bridge took 30,000 hours. But the 10,000 hours is extremely finite across all sorts of disciplines including even those who are egg sexes to decide whether the egg is going to have a female or male chicken. 10,000 hours to get to the skill that is, is actually required. The intriguing thing, um, or an intriguing thing, was uh, a number of years ago, I went around Sydney and talked to a number of top-rated psychiatrists and physicians. And I said to them, how many years did it take you to acquire your high level of clinical skills. And these were ACE diagnosticians. And the average answer was 30 years. The paradox is that most people are about to retire when they achieve their highest level of clinical skills. Now, in terms of uh, psychiatry, major depression is a pretty good example um, because it has no intrinsic meaning in and of itself. Um, and it's a, just a domain diagnosis. It encompasses melancholia and non-melancholic depression and anxiety and whatever. It's meaningless. So, and it's further meaningless because it basically homogenizes all those conditions. So you end up with an average, which doesn't mean anything. So I'm a big subtyper. I want to know whether somebody's got melancholia or bipolar disorder or whatever. And to do so, I focus a lot on individual symptoms that wait to the pattern. Um, and of course, that just is to help make the diagnosis. That's not to say that I ignore the patient's background. Everybody has their own narrative. It's highly important. 
So diagnosis or waiting to diagnosis doesn't mean that you're ignoring the individual themselves. So how do I go about it? Well, obviously, like everybody else, I look at the referral note. Uh, I, I observe the patient as they walk in. I'm fascinated in medical student exams. The medical student only starts observing when the patient has sat down and the student has brought out their paper uh, to record. They fail to look at the patient when they're walking through. And the patient may you know, have a hemiparesis, all sorts of things, or tardiodyskinesia or whatever. So watching the patient as they walk into your room, how they greet you, uh, where there's light in their eyes, and so on and so forth. And then you take your history, and all of us have particular favorite symptoms and signs that we're searching for that will wait a diagnosis. For instance, for melancholia, one of the key features I look for, or if it's an adolescent, I ask the parents for, does he or she lose the light in their eyes when they're depressed? Um, and so on and so forth. Um, and you then also need to seek to exclude alternative diagnoses. Out of that, as I said earlier, you have the chance of giving the patient a most likely a probable diagnosis. And as I also mentioned previously, I like to build in the level of confidence and also an etiology. Pattern analysis is intrinsically a very fast process. So, Danny Carmen, here's a question for all of you. A bat and a ball cost a dollar ten cents. The bat costs a dollar more than the ball. How much does the ball cost? Answer? Say? Five cents? Others? Well, this is the most unusual audience. Because <laughs> virtually everybody says 10 cents. And in Carmen's book, he talks about Harvard students, 80% of them, Harvard graduates, I should say, 80% of them say 10 cents. I presume most of you read Danny Carmen's book. The answer is, of course, five cents. But most people intuitively will say 10 cents. Because uh, if the ball is five cents and the bat is a dollar more, it's a dollar oh five, the two is a dollar ten. So the point is the pattern analysis is very fast, and being fast, it can make and take risks. So he goes on to say that this type of fast thinking uh, generates impressions and feelings, but unfortunately it's very gullible. Uh, bias to believe certain things, automatic, effortlessly, no voluntary control over this type of thinking. It looks for prototypes or exemplars. It tries to construct the best story out of all the ideas. And it can, however, benefit from skilled training, build up the pattern analysis. For instance, in his book, he talks about fire chiefs who suddenly say to their team in a burning building, out of this building now. They get out and 10 seconds later, the roof has collapsed. And when they interview the fire captain and say, what did you hear or see? He cannot explain it. But he's built up an underlying pattern. The problems again are it neglects ambiguity and it suppresses doubt. It focuses on the existing evidence and it ignores absent evidence. So reprising it all, um, Basically, in assessing a mood disorder, I'd argue you ask your questions, you observe your signs, you come up with a probabilistic estimate, and then you eventually come in an area where there's no benchmark laboratory test to your prototypic diagnosis, which may be, um, say, melancholic depression. However, if you do that very fast um, and leave it at that, then are, there, are, there are the obvious risks. And so I just want to tell you about a patient I saw a while back, 45-year-old person who came in and said, look, I've developed this terrible depression. And when I took the history and when I looked at the person, it was classic melancholic depression, no light in the eyes, psychomotor disturbance, all the endogeneity symptoms that you've learnt over the years, that person had. Similarly, she said that her mother had developed uh, this type of depression at the same age. Put on an antidepressant and four to six weeks later she was completely out of it. Everything was fine. She came back a year later and she said it's all come back again. The symptoms are all there. And she again had the psychomotor retardation and so on and so forth. 
I said, are you still taking the antidepressants? No, I stopped them about six months ago. So fast analysis would say, it's bleeding obvious, has melancholic depression, did brilliantly on antidepressant, just put, put her back on the antidepressant. Anyway, I said, any other symptoms, luckily? And she said, well, yeah, I dropped, last time I played golf, I went around 10 less than usual. Any other symptoms? I got a little bit of tingling uh, my left finger and I dropped my shopping the other day in the supermarket. Anything else? A little bit of tingling the right side of the face. Anyway, sent her off and she had a subdural hemorrhage that was operated on that night and she did extremely well, had no depression afterwards. And a year later she came back with classic melancholic depression again, uh, normal brain investigations. Point of story, the same pattern on three occasions but with two quite contrasting causes. So pattern analysis gets you there, but you, then you need that second phase of checking to make sure that your intuition is not idiosyncratic. So explicit reasoning, rational reasoning, logical reasoning is by contrast very slow. Um, it's sort of a painting by numbers exercise um, at worst. But it does need to be brought into diagnostic reasoning as that second phase to make sure that when you make your diagnosis, it is melancholia and not a subdural hemorrhage. So Kahneman articulates the process, I think, very well. The first phase is automatic, intuitive, pattern analysis. The second phase is deliberate and you're checking um, in a more logical, rational way. But ideally, I would suggest to you, it's an iterative process. 